Good morning everybody, my name is Alex and I've just got a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, last month I didn't get around to choosing a patron of the month. Now admittedly this was entirely my fault and so this month I've got two patrons of the month so I want to say congratulations to Paul and to Karen, both of whom I've been in contact with. Um, I'll be sending you both a book of your choosing as a small token of my appreciation for your support of the channel. Um, if anybody else wants to support the channel on Patreon, the link is in the description. Um, of course you can also now support the channel by buying the merchandise that's now available um, if you so please whatever way in which you can help the channel even if it's just by spreading the word and leaving comments and starting discussions it's all greatly appreciated as I'm sure you already know but anyway let's get down to business shall we Peter Hitchens has always been a really rather intriguing character to me I've actually had the pleasure of meeting him in person in a bookshop once where he made it explicitly clear that he wasn't particularly fond of my admittedly rather presumptuous presence but putting my personal experience with the man aside uh, you've probably already seen a debate in which he took part in my home city at the Oxford Union where he was arguing for the proposition that God does exist and I have to say that after having stumbled across this video on numerous occasions I've always been left less than impressed. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I hate this argument. In fact, I loathe taking part in it almost more than any other argument I ever, ever take part in. For why? Because I have to come up here and defend the religion of love, brotherhood, peace, justice, and turning the other cheek rather than kicking the other guy in the crutch. Hold on, can we just rewind for a moment? The religion of love. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? I must say that being referred to as an unrighteous darkness doesn't seem particularly loving to me. And I'm not going to bore you with the countless examples I could bring up of God exercising hatred rather than love over his own people, um, because after all, we are limited with the time that we have. Brotherhood. Yes, I'm particularly impressed by God's advocacy for brotherhood in Exodus chapter 32, verse 37. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. This order was promptly carried out after being declared by Moses and around 3,000 people were slaughtered. Some brotherhood. Peace. Ah yes, peace. Except in Matthew chapter 10 verse 34 where Jesus says, Think not that I am here to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Justice. Of course. It's not like God would ever commit any injustices, like, I don't know, destroying the home of one of his devout followers, killing his children, his animals and his servants, and giving him sores and boils all over his body just to win a bet with the devil. Because that wouldn't be particularly just now, would it? And turning the other cheek rather than kicking the other guy in the crutch. Yes, this comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 39, which opens with the line, But I say to you that you must not oppose those who want to hurt you which is quite possibly the single worst piece of advice in the Bible. Perhaps it was placed there so that God's own tyranny could go unchecked. When he destroys your city or kills your family, just turn the other cheek, let it be. And don't oppose those who hurt you like a predator Catholic priest or a deranged Albanian nun. No, no, just lie down and take it like a good Christian. And I have to listen, I have to listen while I'm doing it to these gentlemen who remind me constantly of the most irritating, infuriating, revolting person I ever knew. If he doesn't say his brother, I will be sorely disappointed. Namely, my adolescent self. Ah. Although, I mean, you, you're probably right. Honestly. Honestly. I mean, haven't we all heard it all before? Horus, Mithras, they're all the same. No, oh no, they're not all the same. They all disagree with each other. They must be wrong. They can't all be right. Yes, we certainly have heard all of these arguments before, Mr. Hitchens, but there's a reason that they're still in circulation because they're yet to be sufficiently rebutted. In fact, doing exactly this seems to be your job in this debate, and instead you simply dismiss the discussion as if it's going to convince anybody that you would be able to win the argument if you really tried to. This is the stuff of sixth form debate. There has been nothing serious said against the concept of God by the opposition this evening at all. Now thanks to the format in which the Oxford Union uploads these debates, I'm actually unable to tell which arguments have been presented before your turn to speak, but I'm delighted to say that that doesn't really matter. Even if it were true that nobody had argued well against God's existence ever, 
it wouldn't make the concept of a god an easier one to buy. The burden of proof lies with he who makes the claim, not with he who tries to criticise it. If there haven't been any good arguments against God, perhaps that's because there haven't been any good arguments for God to argue against. I am expecting something serious to come from the third speaker, but there hasn't been anything so far. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping, because it would be nice. Uh, because this is not fundamentally a serious discussion as it has been held so far from the other side. And it's not serious for a very simple reason. It's not arguing about what we ought to be arguing about. I'm going to have a little bit of poetry here uh, for those of you who appreciate that sort of thing. Uh, it's from the 38th chapter of the book of Job. Do remind me again what happens in the book of Job. If you've forgotten, I'll leave a link in the description to a video by Dark Matter 2525 explaining the whole story. Uh, God speaks from the whirlwind, and he asks, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? The answer, ladies and gentle, gentlemen, from the opposition is they haven't a clue. No, it's not. It's not that we don't know where we were when God laid the foundations of the earth. We don't believe he did that at all. I have a feeling you're a little mixed up in trying to make a different point, that we more broadly just don't know how Earth was created at all. We do, uh, but I'll grant you that we don't know what caused the universe to form, if anything. But that's fine, we don't claim to and never have. We just claim that you don't know either. That's kind of our whole argument. Nor have I. <laughs> Nor has anybody in this room. We haven't the faintest idea. Nothing that any of us could say here tonight could convince anybody that they knew that God existed. What we are discussing here is a matter of opinion. And a matter of opinion, Mr. President, is a matter of choice. And the real question before us is why we choose what we choose. Oof, you're really going to try to so obviously reframe the whole debate? We're talking about whether or not God exists. That's literally the subject of the debate. And instead, you want to discuss why people believe or don't believe. I could spend hours discussing with you why some people believe in global warming and some don't, but that would say absolutely nothing about the truth of the belief itself. If you don't want to try to convince anybody that God exists when your proposition is God exists, then pardon my indelicacy, but why exactly are you here? And this is the most fascinating part of the argument, addressed by the most intelligent and interesting atheist, I think now living, Thomas Nagel, who asks repeatedly, why is it that I and my fellow atheists so much want there not to be a god. Why is it, ladies and gentlemen, they so much want there not to be a god? That's not how I see it at all. What I really want to know is the truth. My opinions don't so much as come into it. Of course, there are many atheists who don't want there to be a god, as there are many who do, but again, this holds no relevance to the current discussion whatsoever. Why would you want there not to be a god? Why would you want to live in a purposeless chaos, in which none of your actions had any significance, in which there was no hope of justice, in which the lives of all those whom you loved ended abruptly at death and had no further significance, why would you want, desire, actively wish to live in a universe as disgusting as that? Well, why would you want to live in a world where suffering and death and pain and misery were not due to blameless worldly factors, but rather due to the intent of a supreme being? Why would you want to live in a world where you have to sacrifice your freedoms and limit your choice of sexual and marital partners by half? It goes both ways, Mr. Hitchens. I could ask you the same thing. But even if I agreed with you that an atheistic world would be a horrendous one, it wouldn't change the facts in any way. You'd have to have a very good reason. And I think these gentlemen do have a very good reason, and it's what they never, ever wish to discuss. They don't want justice. They do want the dead to be dead. They do want the universe to be purposelessness. They do not want their own individual actions to have any other significance than their immediate effect. You will have to discuss with them why they should be so keen on that proposition. You don't get to speak for other people like that, Hitchens. I could try the exact same trick on you, claiming that you want to be a slave to your master, that you want homosexuals to burn in hell, that you want slavery to be permissible. How would you react to such allegations? 
And how is that misrepresentation of you any different from the misrepresentation of the opposition that you've just presented? But from our side of the argument, what we say is that if we desire justice for ourselves, we also desire it for other people. And likewise, if we desire it for other people, we require it for ourselves and we bring it upon ourselves. And on the basis of that, we construct, with some difficulty, with a certain amount of historical knowledge, in the case of some of us with an enormous amount of scientific knowledge of the universe, we construct a belief which helps us to discover, insofar as it is possible, what it is we ought to do and how it is we ought to live in the belief that there is justice, that there is hope, that death is not the end, that our actions have a significance beyond what we immediately do. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank Peter Hitchens for making my argument for me. Mr. Hitchens, you just said that you so badly want there to be purpose in the universe and life after death, among other things, that you will, quote, construct a belief. And that's an admirable choice of wording. If there is any better evidence to suggest that you've created God rather than God creating you, I'm yet to see it. That really is what we are discussing. Do you want it or do you not want it? If you don't want it, then you can simply turn with raillery and badinage and mock the beliefs of others. Yes, because that's all atheist academics ever do, just ridicule and mock. Nobody ever takes it seriously. Oh, no, wait, sorry, that's, that's you who doesn't take this discussion seriously, isn't it? Uh, because this is not fundamentally a serious discussion as it has been held so far from the other side. Mr. Hitchens, your argument is, in summary, wouldn't it be lovely if God did exist? And I suppose without him I'd have to be a slimy, narcissistic, no-good atheist. Look up Laplace, some of you, and find out what an extremely nasty piece of work he was. I've no wonder he had no need for the concept of God. They know perfectly well that if everybody didn't believe in God, the comfortable lives they live in extremely agreeable suburbs, where they can trust people not to cheat them and rob them and mug them and rape them, would come to an end. Yeah, no, yeah, God definitely exists. Now, I have left out the tail end of the original clip for time's sake, but I don't think I've cut anything important. And besides, the full link is available in the description, so if you think that I'm cheating you or anything, uh, go and watch it and feel free to further challenge me in the comments if you'd so like. But in the meantime, I've been Alex O'Connor or Cosmic Skeptic. You can find me on social media here. I want to thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.